Damn. Reincarnated. I'm a stargazing. Life goes on. I need to my babies. Yeah, yeah. Woke up looking for the broccoli. I keep, keep a horn on me. That could my seat. I peep on the ship. The blueprint is by me. Mr. Get Off. I get off in my yeah, yeah. Woke up looking for the broccoli. I keep, keep a horn on me. That could my seat. I peep on the ship. The blueprint is by me. Mr. Get Off. I get off in my yeah, yeah. Join Town Pump's Pump It Up Rewards Plus program and never pay full price for fuel again. Save five cents on every gallon every day at any Town Pump across Montana. Plus, earn and redeem points on your favorite in-store items to get free stuff with our clubs. Stop in and pick up a rewards card. Download the Pump It Up Rewards Plus app today. Or visit townpump.com slash rewards to register and start saving. Ryan with Ryder back for another week. We got Big Sky Conference play on the horizon. Before we get to that, though, let's give a little synopsis of what's going on at Montana State. They had a weird scheduling quirk where they were supposed to play Stephen F. Austin. That ended up not happening. So they get a bye even a week earlier than the early bye was supposed to be. Then they play Mercyhurst. But I think that there's huge advantages and disadvantages to what has happened to Montana State over the last several weeks. They get a great test week one against an FBS school. They come back, they win that game. Then they go on the road and play a team they're supposed to beat, and they get another road win at Utah Tech. Then they have just two games where they just get to cruise with a buy-in between. So on one hand, you get a whole bunch of time for a whole bunch of guys to develop. And, you know, they played as many guys on the football field so far as any team in the league. I mean, I think every guy that's sort of on the varsity has gotten plays in games the last couple weeks. And you got to buy in between. On the other hand, though, you haven't played a team that's really that good in almost a month, even though we're about a month into the season. So I uh, compare and contrast that with us. Mike Ryder going to us here, of course, on Riding with Ryder. Uh, the advantages and disadvantages of that scenario. I, I think the advantages, Colter, are some of the things you're alluding to. You, you really do get a lot of guys playing time. And that's after fall camp, when there's also an opportunity where you're getting quite a few reps and you're evaluating guys. And so you get to go from uh, an evaluation stage during fall camp and, and figuring out, you know, what guys are going to be contributors. Uh, and then you roll right into the season where yet you got your FBS game, you get a lot of momentum. And then, like you said, you've got three games and a bye week in there where you're evaluating how do we create depth and what does that actually look like? Um, and so, you know, that will continue to happen throughout the season because, you know, look, all these guys are going to continue to improve uh, and you've got to continue to be, you know, growing as a player throughout the season. But, uh, you know, something had to be established these last four weeks. You now know based on injuries, based on availability, based on ability, who are the guys that you're going to count on as you march into the big sky season and hopefully make a really deep playoff push, uh, your, your roster is starting to solidify more and more who has a role and who doesn't. So I think that's the benefit, you know, the, the detriment is, you know, some may say, look, maybe you took your buy too early. Uh, well, you know, it, it kind of depends on how healthy you were and they really weren't all that healthy. So, well, and they got uh, another one coming up too. So that that's the point where you, you're playing the week zero game is so huge because if you can win it they, and you get the first buy, then you get another buy. Like that is going to be the most enormous benefit for them. Yeah. Oh yeah. I, I, I totally agree. And, and there's guys expect you to come back. And I know they're probably going to, from what I've understood, uh, use some strategy on some guys that are set to return, but also maybe preserve another year of playing based on, on some of the rules. And so, um, I, I think yeah, you kind of play the cards that you're dealt and good football teams, regardless of when your buy comes in or, or what have you, you've got to find a way to adjust and continue to uh, to improve. But I think it helps the Bobcats for uh, a number of reasons, from a depth perspective, from a health because they needed it. Um, and then, like you mentioned, they got one coming. So uh, I'm fired up for Bobcat or for, uh, for Big Sky Conference play. It's, it doesn't get any better. Uh it's fun to play those non-conference, but man, when you start having the weight of a conference title on the line, it doesn't get any better. Last year, Montana State got this unbelievable measuring stick right away. And I actually think that kind of clouded their vision. Like they went to South Dakota State and they competed and 
they lost, but in a controversial fashion, and a lot of people thought they probably should have won, both because of the call, but also just because, you know, you take out all the crazy egregious mistakes from the false starts to the not being able to capitalize when he got the ball inside the five on a punt block and all that sort of stuff. But you didn't, you lost. But then I think that there was like this narrative around Bobcat Nation, so to speak. Oh, we took the defending champs down to the wire. We are right there. You know, we lost by four in a place that's probably a seven point advantage. So like we're dead even with South Dakota State. And then I think that they sort of forward thinking instead of in the moment, take care of business. And I think that that's where they kind of got bit when they lost at Idaho. And then they kind of was went away from them. Either way, though, uh, I can see both sides of it, right? Because there's a lot of people on Twitter, a lot of people that are Grizz people that are hating on Montana State right now because, you know, they're number three in the country. They got all these statistical uh, <laughs> accomplishments and, oh, well, who have they played? Who have they played? I get it. I also think there's this subtle art of building confidence and building momentum throughout a season. The irony is that the Grizz are the team that does this the best out of everybody. Oftentimes, Bobby Houck wants to play a softer non-conference so that his team can be on a big winning streak by the time they get into the, the Mita conference play. So I guess I could, I can see both sides of it. That said, if you're going to have a, a favorable schedule early on, I think that the Cats have had the best version of it because they haven't been just empty in the tank and trying to win 72 to 10 or whatever. They have put everybody on the field. So even if it is a softer schedule or whatever, they've, they've just gotten a lot of reps for a lot of guys. So I expect them to look sharp, even if it has been, overmatched teams they've been playing the last several weeks as they go to Pocatello this week. Yeah. And, and it's always different on the road, right? Taking the show on the road uh, and uh, a run game and a defense, it, it has to travel. Uh, it has to travel. And that's, that's the calling card of, of Brent Vegan's teams. And so it'll be interesting to see uh, how sharp they look, understanding that uh, it's going to be a tougher test than what they face, you know, these last, um, uh, last couple of weeks. So, uh, Idaho State will be ready. Uh, going down to Pocatello is always an interesting experience. It's a bus trip. There are a lot of different factors, but um, I think this team looks primed. Um, they, uh, you know, they did what they were supposed to do, Colter against Mercyhurst. I, I, you know, watched it and then I rewatched the game and was checking some stuff out. Uh, a lot of things that they, you know, they, didn't get exposed on just based on ability. Quite frankly, there were some things that happened and some miscues and uh, some open gaps and some things uh, that didn't really show themselves. And uh, they didn't because I think just the level of play, but um, all in all, uh, they've gotten a lot of re- uh, bank reps, a lot of depth established, uh, hopefully, and and uh, they'll be ready to go on the road here in Pocatello. You, you mentioned that trip. You've played there. You've coached there. It's it's not a tough trip because the home field advantage is so intimidating, but it is a tough trip because it is, you know, four-hour bus ride. It's a weird arena. It's, it's just different than everywhere else you're going to play. It's, it's sort of old. The orange seats give it some weird depth perception. Even if there's not a ton of people there, the PA is really loud, and they always turn it up when the Montana schools are there, certainly, to try to, to help that uh, that home field advantage. From your perspective, first start with as a player, what's the weirdest or, or hardest part about playing at Holt Arena? Oh, gosh. Back when I played, it was actual AstroTurf, so that was interesting in itself, right, playing with playing with tennis shoes, but they don't really have to do that anymore. So um, I, I do think the lighting is is unique in Holt. The, yeah, the, the PA announcing um, – and then you just don't really travel on a bus anymore. That really is a weird thing. Like, you know, even the days of traveling to Eastern on a bus, those are gone. We were on a bus. Those are gone. Uh, you know, going to Montana on a bus, you know, that's different because, you know, given the rivalry, but this one is rather unique given you travel on a bus down there. Um, and then I, I feel like Idaho state does an exceptional job uh, pretty much year in and year out playing the Montana schools really, really tough. It used to be a rivalry in the big sky. You can't forget that. And uh, and for uh, a chunk of time there, not in, in the so distant future, uh, or excuse me, the distant past, uh, Idaho State was was pretty salty. I mean, they had some teams that, uh, you know, I realized that they didn't make uh, a deep, you know, playoff push or anything like like that. But they really were a talented team with a gunslinger quarterback. 
uh, kind of us against the world type deal with Kramer, a little bit of that with fantasy. And they had some really good skill guys that we've seen now transfer to other programs and be pretty big contributors. So uh, they fight hard against the Montana schools. And I expect no different this weekend. I was looking back and Tom Stuber wrote a great story that's up on SkylineSportsMT.com right now about the last time the Cats were there. It's crazy, this unbalanced Big Sky schedule. Last time Montana State was in Pocatello was in 2018. <laughs> so, wow. like, Brett Vegan and his staff have never been there before. I mean, this is like year three of Choate, which seems like a lifetime ago now because we're already in year four of Brett Vegan. This is when Troy Anderson was playing quarterback, and, and they had all sorts of stuff going on. So, um Anyways, that was a weird time in Bobcat football because they were piecing it together. Troy was playing quarterback. They made that weird OC change in the middle of the year when Choate just abruptly fired Bob Cole. And then he like kind of promoted Brian Armstrong, but not really. And then he said, nope, it's Matt Miller's show. It actually turned out to be the right decision because then they got really good on offense the next couple years once Miller found his footing. But they went down there to Pokey and they lost. And it's fascinating to think, though, at that exact moment, Idaho State – was a 5-3 and three football team with a better record in conference play than the Cats. The Cats had their backs against the wall. The rest of that season, though, they didn't lose again until they had to go to Fargo in the playoffs. And then the next year, they went 11-2 and two and went all the way to the semifinals of the playoffs. They've only lost 14 games since that game. Idaho State's only won 11 games since that game. So talk about, like, these two programs that are meeting, and they were both sort of mediocre, but – then the way that they've gone in different directions, even though ISU won that game, I don't know. I thought that was just fascinating to analyze. And part of that's just been, you have multiple coaches. It's just hard to get it going, right? Like they totally fantasy had it and then he lost it. And then they let, let him go. Then they hired Charlie Raggle. That was a disaster. That only lasted a year. And now I think they got a guy who's going to get it going a little bit, but it just takes some time. I just think that's one of the hardest jobs in the league. Yeah, I, I agree. And then, you hate to say it, but some of it comes down to money too, right? Just from funding and some of those things. How do you pay guys to get in there as far as coaching is concerned? Um, but they've they've uh, done what they can to make some improvements to Holt Arena. Um, they do recruit, you know, hard and, and they, they get some really good skill players. We've seen that. I mean, think about some of the guys that have been come out of Idaho State. Uh, and then, look, I think the state of Idaho plays some pretty good football. You can get some of those guys out of Idaho. Um, you know, the cats have gone in there and gotten some, I know the Grizz are always there. Uh, you can get some of those guys. If you can keep a few of them home, uh, you know, they've got the ability to, uh, to recruit and, um, you know, uh, you know, decent school as well. And so um, I think, uh, you know, the Hawkins crew, they'll, they'll get it going. Um, interesting role reversal, right. With, with the young Hawkins now at the helm and his dad helping uh, uh, assist on that. So uh, those guys know what they're doing. The, the, their team will be ready on, on Saturday and it'll be a nice fun conference opener. I'm looking forward to it. There's always a party in Montana. Whether you're going to a wedding, a football game, a concert, Montana Party Bus can get you there safe and will take you anywhere in Montana. You can relax with friends in style, luxury, and safety. Western Montana based for local and regional travel within Montana borders. Montana Party Bus is great for both large and small groups with a capacity of up to 30 guests. If you want to elevate your event, call them anytime. 406-200-8096. You can also visit mtpartybus.com. Traveler Anywhere in Montana in style with the Montana Party Bus. The other weird part, though, is that this will be Brent Vegan's 25th Big Sky Conference game coaching at Montana State. He's never played in this arena. He's only played at Idaho State once. <laughs> that and it, both those things are so weird. When it comes to going down there from the coaching staff perspective, what sort of things do you think that they need to – to prepare for and mitigate and, and all that. Man, I, I think it's always interesting when you have a bus trip because you're kind of like, all right, well, how, how far, you know, I mean, just little things like how many stops do you make along the way? Do you stop and do a little bit of a walkthrough to get people's legs, you know, stretched out? Or do you get all the way, push all the way there, and then you're doing a walkthrough? Uh, the hotel situation was, I just remember staying there was rather interesting. Man, we stayed in, I don't remember where it was. It was a dump. It was a like a, it was a motel. I remember, I remember staying in this motel being like, 
my senior year, I'll never forget that. I'd be like, boy, there has to be something better here in Pocatello. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's all those types of things, uh, you know, and, and I think those coaches, they'll handle it well. But, but truthfully, man, you, you kind of go into robot mode, right? They, they try, they control from the, the, the snack at night to the meal that's being served to the time of the walkthrough to the time of film to the time of chapel. Uh, all of that is going to stay very, very consistent. And you try and go in a little bit of robot mode. It's, it's by design. And so uh, my, my guess is those coaches will stick to the program. It'll look exactly the same. Uh, try and make it, uh, you know, feel as familiar as possible. And, um, and they'll have them ready to go. But it, it is a tougher place to play. It does get loud. And those fans, they'll be there. And, um, you know, there's a mo- there's more of an energy there at Idaho State now. You got a young head coach who uh, has an innovative offense. Uh, he's got some real, you know, uh, I just think he's got something uh, to him as far as personality-wise. And uh, there's a toughness to that team. And, um, you know, trying to bring the pride back to that program. So, uh, it'll be a really fun, challenging matchup on Saturday. Brian with Ryder, presented in part by Uptop Clothing. Uptop Clothing, helping us celebrate our 10th anniversary at Skyline Sports. You want to get a discount on all your online orders, use Skyline 15 at checkout. TeamUptop.com, Uptop Clothing, reminding you to take a step back and enjoy the moment. You mentioned some of the stuff that you want to see Montana State maybe tinker, tweak, improve on. I thought it was fascinating that Mercyhurst said, hey, we're going to put eight in the box and run a one eye safety look and say, throw it. Let's see if you can do it. A lot looked good. I mean, Tabby was 14 of 18 for 214 yards and three touchdowns. How much does that translate, though, when you're actually going to be playing big sky defensive backs this week? Can it translate, or where are we at with the I, I, Absolutely. I, I think confidence wise, you know, some of those deep balls, he threw a couple of really nice corner balls. Uh, you know, one, uh, kind of off his back foot and dropped dropped in the bucket. Um, uh, I think that was King that caught that ball. And then, of course, the nice touchdown pass to Taco Dowler. That was a really good placement. He did underthrow a couple deep balls. Um, it looked, you know, uh, k- kind of interesting. But um, I-, I think they stuck to their DNA in trying to run the football. And, and the offensive line did what we would expect them to do. And, boy, th- those holes were huge. The backs were were really productive. Um, defensively, um, I, I was actually a little bit concerned on some of the RPO stuff that was given up. Uh, I thought Mercyhurst did a pretty good job that, you know, uh, their, their undersized quarterback did a good job, uh, putting it into some slant windows, uh, off some RPO looks. Um, and, and then there was just some misfits on the run game late when some of those guys were filling in that again, you just you can't have in game four and it didn't look like much uh, in the middle of a game when you're up 31 to zero, but boy, you get into some, some meaningful minutes and uh, those things can't happen, especially down the stretch in conference play. So uh, look plenty to coach on. And as a coach, you love that when there's a ton to coach on and you know, you're continuing to get better, you have to get better, but you win handily. And so um, I'm sure those coaches got those things corrected and uh, yeah, it's, there's, still a, a building and you you have to you're either getting better or you're getting worse Colter throughout the season and your your good teams continue to improve even just on the small things and the fundamentals and then you stack those bye weeks in there where you get a chance to get healthy but you're also going back to the fundamentals you just it's all part of the process and I think Beacon does a good job of just look we're going to go one and oh this is part of the process and this week that it happens to take us to Pocatello. When it comes to just the the broad perspective of the Cats in conference play, that's one thing that I've been so unbelievably impressed with with Brent Vegan. You look at his body of work, the the majority of their losses have come either to North Dakota State or South Dakota State in the playoffs, at Montana the two times they've played there, or to FBS programs. The only other game that they've dropped is at Idaho last year, and that, that was one where – the kicking woes were in there sort of against them. They had a whole bunch of uh, different things go uh, against them. But I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if it's a, a surefire bet, but it, it seems like if it's a Big Sky Conference game and Brent Vegan and his staff are at the helm, unless it's a big-time rivalry game, Montana State's in a pretty good spot. I mean, they literally have won every game in that scenario unless it's in Missoula or the one time they've gone to, to Moscow. Yeah. 
Yeah, and the, the proof's in the pudding, and you kind of give credit where credit's due. Uh, and if you look across the landscape of college football culture, that's what good, dominant teams, and regardless of the conference, that's what they do. I don't care if you look at Alabama and what they did. Uh, you know, losing a conference game should be a shock. You prepare in the SEC, and they expect to go win, whether it's, you know, at Auburn in a rivalry game or to go dominate in Nashville in front of nobody against Vanderbilt. That's what you do. And, um, I, I mean, you got to give credit to uh, yeah, to Coach Vegan and staff because it's not an easy league, and there are teams that can sneak up on you. And I think this weekend is a perfect example. you got to be ready to go, and you've got a, a, a target on your back. And, uh, and, and so you, you've got to be prepared. But uh, ultimately, I think it just is a testament to where the program's gotten to, Coulter. I mean, uh, uh, you know, Montana had this forever. Right for a really long time, Montana was in a in a position where going down and and losing a conference game like that just that's not what they did. You know, Cat Grizz was always you know could it wasn't really a great contest. They just had their sights and their expectations set on playoffs and deep playoff pushes and home field advantage throughout the playoffs and winning a conference title was just part of the process. And so it's just interesting now that you see that same thing because there's the conference has improved. Montana expects that. Montana State expects that. Idaho expects that. Shoot, Sacramento State for a chunk of time expected that, right? Uh, Eastern is a little bit on the, on the you know, falling down just a little bit, but there's a lot of teams in there that expect to go and win these conference games on the road or at home, and to me it just speaks to how quality the league is. Riding with Ryder each week here on the Big Sky Breakdown podcast series, as well as our Skyline Sports YouTube channel. Mikey Ryder chiming in on all things Bobcat football. Thanks for being here, man. Really appreciate it. And then we'll talk to you next week. Appreciate your culture. Thanks for having me. Meeting her stopped your world. The ring you give her should stop her heart. <laughs> Tina, will you marry me? Not again. Don't worry. I'm going to fix this because we want to be your jeweler. Aren't our, our beautiful diamond clear? Come back to me, Tina. Are you okay?